So Christian, when you first contacted us about um, speaking on witnessing Catholic life today, my initial reaction was, ooh, that's way too close to a public display of emotion. Something, um, as an English person, I'm definitely not comfortable with. And this was uh, further underscored by the horrified reaction from our children to the idea that their, their parents might actually stand up here and spill the beans on everything that had gone on <laughs> behind the doors of 50 Scarsdale Villas. How was this consistent with the long-standing uh, rule at home, what goes at home stays at home? And uh, just to illustrate uh, how hard that firm that rule is uh, in, in our family, uh, one of our children, uh, age, uh, then um, aged eight, had to take an entrance exam for a school. Yeah, it's a very uncivilized thing that goes on in England, that even at eight you take entrance exams. <laughs> anyway, he was asked to write an essay um, on his family. And so he wrote, I have two brothers, I have two sisters, and the rest none of your business. <laughs> So, so having, having overcome their horror, um, the children responded in their usual way. And I, I do refer to Christian's father in this. Uh, and I have to say that everything he said yesterday resonated uh, very clearly with us. And I thought at the end of his presentation, well, we don't need to stand up. He said it all. But one of the things he did say was the importance of humor. And so our children, when they heard about this and they'd got over their horror, took it upon themselves to make um, a short video spoof. Now, I'm not sure whether it's just Maria and I who find this funny, because it's our children and they're spoofing us. But at the risk that you won't find it funny, we thought we'd show it to you anyway. So welcome to Vienna, to the Catholic Synod on the Family. And I'd like to introduce Tim and Maria Church from London, who are going to speak to us about their experience of family life. Welcome, Tim and Maria. Hello. So my Hello. first question to you is just to tell us a little bit about your family. Well, uh, we, have, we come from London, and uh, my husband is English, and I am Dutch. And uh, we have five children. The oldest is a doctor. Uh, the middle is uh, in uh, the mission. And the youngest is uh, the son, the, my sons, uh, uh, maybe in the, going in the religious field. And uh, the daughters are doing okay also. And, uh, and we have a very happy Catholic life, I think. Yes? I, I, would, I would agree. We both Catholic, <laughs> from Catholic families yourselves. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, I was uh, originally Church of England. But he became a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm now a Catholic. And um, how do you bring Catholic living into your daily lives? Well, um, darling, do you mind if I take this one? Yes, you can. Uh, so we've always had a motto in the family, which is work hard, play hard, pray hard. Yes, but I would also say that, you know, a family that stays together, they pray together. Mm. Well, I think it's when they pray together. Oh, a family that prays together, they stay together. And Rhea, how have you found it being Catholic in England? Is it very different from home? Yes, but you know, you have to be Catholic wherever you are. And here it's okay too. And I just tell my children, my children must all go to Mass. And if they don't go to Mass, then no cheese. So, it's, it's tempting at that point to say, I rest my case, there's our witness. Anyway, but it was um, Maria's encounter with a former British family High Court judge, Sir Paul Coleridge, that changed our minds about um, witnessing and speaking. And through his work in the English family courts, um, he had witnessed his first-hand deep crisis in family life in the UK and its immense cost to society, which inspired him to form a foundation, the Marriage Foundation, to campaign for marriage and the traditional family. 
And so listening to him, we realized how, just how serious uh, this issue is. We all of us yearn for a fullness of life. And Maria and I have been truly blessed with and immensely grateful for food from heaven, the water of life in the sacraments, baptism, marriage, and the Eucharist. Knowing Christ through signs of his redemptive presence in the midst of our family life. For each one of us, our fundamental purpose in life is to reach and be fully united with God. And the breakdown in family life is merely one manifestation of how society today and even the church in some ways are failing in that purpose. So from our point of view, the topic of this conference, reinvigorating the, uh, the sacrament of marriage in the Christian family, could not be more timely and important. And it's one of the most powerful opportunities we had for evangelization and encouraging a an deeper encounter with the Lord. So if we believed all that, and we do, we felt that we should at least attempt to speak publicly on the subject. So albeit not core to our allotted topic of witnessing Catholic life today, I'll briefly share a few of the statistics that illustrate just how deep the crisis is in the UK and its cost to society. They were, after all, the catalyst to us standing here. We, particularly Maria, will then focus on sharing with you, witnessing our experience of Catholic life in London. And then our wrap up, we'll wrap up with a few themes that we've drawn together of what we've learned from the last 34 years. We hope, though, that you'll take away a message of encouragement. As Bishop James alluded to, we're not gloomy about marriage. Yes, there is a crisis, but Christian marriage is beautiful, does work, and is the answer. So a few statistics for the UK, and there are many more of them that one could um, uh, uh, talk about. I have a feeling that the family life uh, has deteriorated more in the UK than in some other European countries, but I suspect that the direction of travel is pretty similar. So in the UK, half of children by the age of 16 are not living with both parents. That's half. And this is eight times more likely to be the case if the parents are not married marriage is demonstrably superior to cohabiting. Only one in 12 uh, marrieds are split before their first child's fifth birthday. That compares to nearly half of cohabiting parents. And this is particularly acute in the poorest so uh, section of society. So only about a quarter of mothers with children under five in the poorest section of society are married versus nearly nine out of 10 in the wealthiest. Family breakdown in the UK costs us more than our total defense budget. Three million children in the UK are currently caught up in some way in the family justice system. So in the UK, family life has broken down particularly amongst the poorest in society, it is costing us massively. Marriage, stable marriage, is the solution to the crisis, and best of all, Christian marriage. So that's a bit of a background. I found those statistics shocking and compelling and uh, realized that we have to talk about this. So first, so we'll now witness, but before doing so, we just will share a little bit of our context with you. In the end, everyone's context is different, and it's important that you, uh, hear our, you, you understand our context. Some people's context is much more challenging than ours. So God has blessed us in many ways. Uh, it's his blessings that have given us 34 years of amazing marriage. As uh, Zygmunt said, we have five children, uh, 31 to 22. Two of them are married, and um, we've got two granddaughters, so we're way behind. <laughs> Certain other families, 26, that's the target out there. <laughs> but anyway, the two are the apples of our eyes. 
I think an important context and something in which we've been incredibly fortunate that I've been gainfully employed pretty much uninterrupted during our married life. And this, of course, means that we've experienced relatively little financial stress. Although it wasn't always plain sailing, the older amongst you might remember the time when interest rates in the UK went from 7 to 15% in as many months, which when you've just bought a house is a little bit of a struggle. Something very difficult to relate to in our negative interest rate world that we have today. And also, as uh, Ziggy said, I spend my time going backwards and forwards between London and New York, which isn't always conducive to marriage or family life. Both of us come from stable families. Different, but stable. I come from an Anglican family, and as you can tell by my voice, I'm English. Maria comes from a Catholic family, and Dutch. We speak in incomprehensible riddles. The Dutch want it straight out. <laughs> Maria was able to, and perhaps as importantly wanted to, stay at home as a mother, as homemaker, and love the challenge of working in the community. We benefited for the invigorating aspect of um, our mixed marriage, of me being an Anglican, initially, which meant from the start we constantly debated faith, and which, which was enriching both for each of us, but also for our children. It became a natural source of debate. And then finally, we live in London, which somewhat counterintuitively actually is a huge asset. Yes, it's replete with temptation and distraction, but it has the huge merit of choice, real choice. Choice of church, choice of priest, relig religious mentors, choice of friends. And as we will witness further, this has been a huge source of strength to us. So all of that was bestowed on us by our Father in heaven. And it certainly made family life a lot easier than many others are dealt. Furthermore, we didn't do anything really to test that context. The sort of parents that really should be standing here are the ones we met in Haiti. They had six of their own children and had adopted six handicapped children and knitted together the most extraordinarily mutual, supporting, prayerful community. We haven't done that. So that's our context, and Maria will now try and encapsulate the 34-year journey. So before I start witnessing Catholic life today, I'd like to illustrate a little bit more that what impacted our family. It was not always plain sailing. We had an, 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 we had an, a situation with the social services where one of our children was investigated um, that we had her left her crying because of discipline into the garden. It was not even us. We were not even at home. It was an, an au pair girl we had. We were uh, investigated by the police because we had a music teacher who was investigated for pedophilia. Um, we um, had um, a lady who came to the house who was murdered by her husband. And this will all to give you an illustration of situations which we had to deal with as a family, and we were open about that to our children. Witnessing Catholic life today in a city like London is extremely hopeful. The churches are packed at all masses on Sunday, and there are a lot of them. Every weekday, masses are well attended. Our pews are filled with young families of many nationalities. There are myriads of courses, formation groups available to feed one's spirituality, such as philosophy, the scriptures, church history, even Latin classes to get more out of the Latin mass. There are model prayers groups, rosary groups in many homes. 
A recent Good Shepherd Montessori catechism training course was attended by over 80 people, resulting in many atriums being started. There are also numerous outreach opportunities, soup kitchen, soup kitchen runs within parishes and those run by religious orders such as the Missionaries of Charity. These serve the poor and also bring communities close together in prayer. There is the exposition of the Blessed Sacrament across the city and an active SOS prayer line now in its 20th year. There is also children's adoration monthly. 40 to 50 little children, the ages between 3 and 12, are quietly for an hour in front of the Blessed Sacrament. The night fever outreach programs attract hundreds of young people in Soho, encouraging people from the street to come into the church to light a candle in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Very little, if any of this existed when we first married 34 years ago. Like most of Europe, the churches were not inspiring for a young family. My early struggle was exacerbated by being Dutch and struggling to understand the English way of living, not to mention the habit of speaking in riddles. <laughs> Tim being an Anglican, I learned that from their intrinsic loyalty and sense of duty to the church, I accompanied him to his service as he did with me. Through his church, I first got involved in community life. And through his church, eventually, I found the Catholic church and priest that was to become such a critical part of our family life. He took us into the, the home of the poor, the homes of the poor, the homes of the elderly, and enriched our whole family with his incredible energy. Trying to live with God in my everyday life, trying to trust in him fully on the path of marriage first and family life to follow was key. I had met Tim, aged 21, at a party of a mutual friend. Both my father and brother had just died, so I was naturally questioning my faith and deepening my encounter with God. Tim was undoubtedly his gift to me. Although counterintuitively, as he was Anglican, I had always presumed I would marry a Catholic. I nevertheless walked the journey fully confident that God was at my side. My trust in him was born in that process. That clarity of God's hand in my life, revealing himself to me, also made it clear to me how I should bring up our children, to stand firm in what belief is right. But I could only do this with God, through prayer. And I knew that whatever decision we were making, whatever the situation, we needed to discern with him, even at times it felt uncomfortable or was difficult. My own upbringing was full of love and stability and very traditionally Catholic. I knew that the challenge for our children would be much greater. Not having family immediately around meant that the urgency to help them to encounter God was strong within me. I was therefore searching daily for that food, which church to go to, making daily prayer alive, trying to meet them where they were, rather than imposing a litany of prayers that did not resonate with them. And we all know that our children are a gift from God. And as I journeyed, I came across a wonderful woman called Veronica Williams. She started a great work for God, Mother's Prayers. And through her and other mothers, I came to know the preciousness of the souls of our little ones. How we have an obligation to imbue the treasure of God with the knowledge of the one who created them. He is the only one who can change things. And we are called on to surrender to him. I learned from Veronica, from her prayers, and from all those mothers with whom we prayed, I have experienced that mother's prayers, followed by giving mothers the magic book of Magnificat, has seen many embark on a journey of faith, beginning to read the gospel, the daily gospel, to teach them to help their journey with beginning to read the daily gospel. Standing here, I find it very difficult, as it is not in my nature to speak publicly, particularly about matters so personal and precious. And I would like to share an anecdote of one of my encounters. 
I was having a conversation with a monk that I had got to know quite well and from whom I had learned a great deal. And he asked me the following. Maria, tell me, what is the joy of having children? It seems a big slog wherever I see children and their parents. It, is ju it just seems to be an everlasting, exhausting job. What is in it? He asked me. It is exhausting. <laughs> I had never had that question before. It was so honest. What were children for us? A gift from God, a grace. But much more than that, although we know that they are hard work, at times trying, and yes, we do get exhausted. But God trusts us to nurture these amazing creatures. If you walk with your child in the purest sense, helping them to learn about the life of Christ, listening to, and most importantly, respect their souls, you will hear God speak to you through your child. Dr. Bernard de Dean yesterday said that the creation of man gives us a glimpse of God, and I have certainly experienced that. Paul Witz explained to us that the answer to this monk's question is innate. It is built into us as mothers. Our children have been our teachers, and still, we learn from them on many occasions. I leave you with two anecdotes. One of our children was not happy with the amount of shared sweets. It's unfair, they say. I, look him on the, I took him on the side and said, you're spoiled. That is spoiled behavior. To which he replied to me, but mama, it is not me that spoiled me. <laughs> I was shopping for school clothes with one of our daughters. And we bought her a barber jacket and I saw a blazer for me and decided to buy that for me too. And over a cup of tea, she said to me, Mama, what I just don't understand is why do we have to look nice from the outside? Isn't the soul all that matters? we learn from our children. But we thought, um, to finish up with, we would, we would try and share with you a few themes, things that, that we had learned from these last uh, 34 years. Um, of course, love is the overarching theme, a love that is um, visible, as both Christian and his father alluded to, is tangible, is alive, is other-centered, focused on loving the person the way they want to be loved, is open. But this isn't a marriage preparation session. What we've learned, our themes, will be different to others. I don't suppose any of them is particularly original or new to people here, but here goes with them. So the five themes we came up with that I think encapsulated our journey. Walk your marriage with God. Marriage first. Create a cradle of safety, pick your journey companions, and this is an all-consuming activity. So, walking with God. This is not an audience in which one needs to explore this concept in any depth, so we won't. But not to lead with it would be to lose the most powerful force one has in navigating the vicissitudes of family life. Prayer will carry you through. And prayer together as a couple and as a family is the most powerful. As Jesus said, for when two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am amongst you. But it goes further than just prayer. We all need constantly to feed our spiritual life and the spiritual life of our children. This needs imagination and creativity as it competes with air for airtime with myriad other compelling distractions. When children are very small, somehow prayer feels natural. A lot of parents pray with their little children. But as they get older, it becomes less natural. But that is when it becomes even more important and powerful. So one message is keep at it. Secondly, marriage first. Obvious, you might think. But this is a concept which was actually hammered home to us through an Australian marriage preparation course 
material that we've been using recently. And actually, we wish we had been aware of it earlier on in our marriage, because it would have clarified some decision making. Simply put, what it means is putting the sanctity and health of your marriage at the forefront of all your decision making, however big or small. What is in the best interest of your marriage? Counterintuitively, that means that your marriage becomes, comes before the interests of your children. Why? Well, it's like the warning you get in the airplane safety notice. Oxygen masks will appear like this. <laughs> Put them across your nose and mouth like this. When the oxygen mask comes down, Put yours on first before you help your child. The reason being you can't help your child or other neighbor if you're suffocating. Similarly, you can't help your children if your marriage is collapsing. Thirdly, create a cradle of safety, otherwise known as creating a home. This one interestingly came from the children when we were talking to them when we got them to focus seriously on the subject of our talk. And when talking to them about what home meant to them, most important to them was that home was a place of safety, physically, emotionally, and perhaps most importantly, honestly. Anything could be said or discussed. This is a place from which you leave, but to which you can always return. This doesn't happen of its own accord. This means great care and attention about who is brought in and for what purposes. On the one hand, home should be an open place, open to discuss all matters, open to being shared with others, importantly, open to the friends of the children, open to the world, but always discerning. It must be protected from influences that seek to undermine it. It must be a place that can be fully trusted. A home is more than four walls. It has a spirit, a way, and each family will have its own unique way. Fourthly, pick your journey companions. This concept is incredibly important actually perhaps the most important. And it has, to use a sort of American sporting term, it has an offensive and a defensive aspect to it. Maria spoke about all that is available in London. I, unbeknownst to me at the time, when we got married, embarked on a long searching journey towards becoming a Catholic. Graham, uh, moved a lot quicker than I did because he took four years. It took me 25 years. <laughs> but that journey of inquiry was enabled by all sorts of extraordinary people. In part, God put them on my path. In part, together we searched for them. They included our first parish priest, an extraordinarily charismatic and gifted pastor. He fully embraced me into his church, including allowing me and indeed encouraged me to receive the Eucharist against all the rules I know. But I'm sure that if he hadn't done that, I would probably still be standing here as a resistant Anglican. Well, I probably wouldn't have been invited here, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another subject. We then encountered the community of St. John, tremendous teachers, rigorous in their formation, able to answer cogently every question I had. One brother in particular, incredibly smart and inspiring, had been a banker in his former life, so was able to meet me where I was. And the list could go on. The message is, that God will put people on your path, but you must also search. And if you live in a big city like London, there's no excuse not to journey with inspiring people of faith. On the defensive side, though, 
we also have to recognize that the devil is at large. And he wants to break up our marriages. And as is often the case with the devil, he acts through others. Consequently, we have to be constantly alive in our marriages, always, always standing by the other publicly, always showing love, never becoming stale in that love, vigilant about our travel companions. We live in an Anglican country. Restricting our community to the practicing Catholic community would severely curtail our relationships and opportunities. Indeed, it would be unnatural. But you can restrict the involvement of those who seek to undermine your journey. At times, this takes courage. It entails saying no to your teenager children, when they discouraging certain friendships, finding distractions. When they're invited to something that you believe to be undermining, can you come up with an alternative? Simply saying, no, you have to stay at home twiddling your thumbs is hardly compelling. Be creative in your distractions and make sure each one is an ever better memory. But this is not just a parenting phenomena. This is also critical in marriage, particularly the early part of marriage. We all arrive at the party with our own baggage, good and bad baggage. We bring myriad of family and friends. Many, hopefully most, of those family and friends will be a support to your marriage, but some will not be. I had a good university friend who didn't believe in marriage. He expressed this clearly early on in our marriage, believing it was merely an interesting discussion point. Well, it wasn't, and that friendship didn't subsist. This issue becomes particularly acute when a marriage encounters difficulty. Have you surrounded yourself with people who are fully committed to the idea till death us do part and are going to do all in their power to help you overcome your difficulties? Or are you mixing with people who will encourage you to go for the exit, people playing the devil's tune? It's interesting that in many modern wedding ceremonies, the congregation is asked explicitly by the priest to confirm that they will be a support. How many actually realize what this means in practice? And of course, the most challenging time is when you feel undermined by parts of your greater family. But this is when resoluteness priorities are so fundamental. Marriage first. Finally, this is an all-consuming activity. Marriage is a vocation. Vocations do and should consume you. They require real sacrifice. Fundamentally, we believe, using a financial term, there is a return on investment. Simply, the more you listen to your two-year-old two year stories, the more she will listen to you when she's a teenager. The same principle holds for your marriage. The more you invest in it, in time, in emotional commitment, in sacrifice, the stronger and more beautiful it will be. We mentioned in the description of our context that we were blessed with Maria both being able to and wanting to stay at home and focus all her energy on building our family. This is neither possible nor appropriate for all couples. As a side comment though, it's such a shame that society doesn't accrue a much higher value to motherhood doesn't see it as a vocation benefiting fully as much from ambition, intelligence, wisdom, energy, instincts, as investment banking, medicine, or consulting. For those who aren't blessed with the mother being able to and or wanting to stay at home, the support model you need around you is even more critical. So those are our five themes. They are merely our attempt, they're not a, a formula, they're our attempt at witnessing Catholic family life today. So yes, family life is in crisis in the UK, and as Sir Paul makes clear, marriage is the solution to many of society's ills. And it's our church, the Catholic Church, that has the richest teaching and the best material for marriage preparation and other courses supporting couples. In London, at least, there's a huge amount of positive momentum. We just need to find ways to reach ever larger audiences with this teaching.
going beyond just the already faithful into the wider community. All of this, ultimately, is a process, from our point of view, of recounting countless gifts from God, each other, our children, and the grace to live the vocations to which we have been called. And my last words are, live your life fully with God, seek him in the many little treasures you receive each day, and thank him for it. Seek him also in your disappointments, your sufferings, and ask yourself what he's trying to teach me. Bring him to others by asking him to show you the way. Thank you.